All right, how's it going, everybody? We are here on Tuesday of week eight. We are going to start off with uh, some chapter nine things here today. Last video, we wrapped up our thoughts on the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem is going to help us judge uh, how likely it is that we're going to see certain types of samples get drawn from a population. That's going to be uh, our sort of key computation that's going to be associated with the topics of the remainder of the semester here. So that one is uh, very important computationally here. What we're going to do here today is setting up uh, our hypothesis tests here in chapter nine. Um, we're going to be spending kind of most of the rest of the semester performing these hypothesis tests that we're setting up here today. Um, so this is uh, an important topic that will survive beyond just this week. Um, next week, uh, we will see how the computations that we did in Chapter 7 are directly associated with the decisions that we're trying to make in Chapter 9. Uh, you should notice also that we skipped Chapter 8 in there. I'm just doing things ever so slightly out of order here. We are going to cover Chapter 8 right after we cover Chapter 9. Um, I just want to, in a sense, emphasize that I think the Chapter 9 stuff is a little bit more important, and that's why we're introducing it first. Um, so next week we'll introduce this idea of the confidence interval. That's something that we'll see in Chapter 8. Confidence intervals are used to make estimates about the value of a parameter. Hypothesis tests are used to make a decision about whether a certain parameter is appropriate or not. Um, and so for confidence intervals, we want to say things like, and again, confidence intervals coming up next week in Chapter 8. Confidence intervals will say things like, I drew a sample of 50 people and found their average height to be 68 inches. Uh, what span of inches do we think that it's most likely that the true population uh, average height falls within? 68 is probably a really good guess, but hopefully we have uh, a sense to believe that it could be perhaps a little bit off from that and that we want to kind of capture a, an interval of values in which we have a specific amount of confidence that our population parameter will fall within that interval. So for the confidence intervals, we're more like estimating a value. Um, these significance tests, however, are more about making a decision, and that's what we're going to talk about here today. So, um, first things first here, we've got our, uh, let's talk about what the significance test is, and let's talk about um, what values of interest we need to be able to identify to perform these significance tests. And again, this is uh, basically an idea that we're going to follow for essentially the remainder of the semester is the significance test right here. Um, so this stuff's really important here. Uh, this, this, this won't go away. This is basically what we're doing for the rest of this class here, more or less. So a significance test, or called a hypothesis test, because we are testing uh, to determine which of two competing hypotheses are true, um, these will help us make decisions about the values of population parameters using sample statistics. And before we even move on from that sentence right there, I know that there's a bunch of vocab words in there, which makes it hard to read. We're trying to make decisions about population parameters. That means I'm trying to make a decision about something like average height for all males. That's a population parameter because we're talking about all males. What information we have available to use is sample statistics, a statistic that we've computed from a sample that we've drawn. So if my interest is in determining the height, the average height of all males, then what I can do is I can take a sample of just 100 males. I can compute the sample statistics of the average and the standard deviation, and I can use that information to make, uh, to, to make uh, decisions about whether I think certain population parameters might be correct. So we're trying to take a little bit of information, the sample, and try to use that information to make the broadest decisions that we can make and estimates that we can make about the entire population. And you should just, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious, we can't just measure the height of every single male in the country to get a true uh, value for the true population average of, of height. Um, what we need to do is be able to take smaller samples and use that uh, sample information to infer something about the broader population. So this is more of an inference thing. Collect a small amount of data, use that data to infer large broad statements about a population. So um, our significance test here is essentially the exact same thing as the scientific method. This is something I brought up on the first day of class. That sort of, in a sense, the goal of this class is for us to be able to mathematically proceed through the, uh, the scientific method. So the scientific method can be stated a bunch of different ways. Um, the, I think the most simplified formulation of the scientific method has four steps in it. Um, and this is, you know, 
This is something I remember learning in like third grade, the scientific method here hasn't changed. Um, the first thing that we need to do is state our hypotheses. That's what we're going to be covering in essentially today's class is we're going to discuss how do we form hypotheses, um, appropriate notation for hypotheses, and uh, the decisions that we make between the two hypotheses. There will always be two hypotheses that come with all of our significance tests. Step two, perform the experiments, uh, collect the data. This is the step that in, in, a, in, in the classroom setting, this is always already done for us, right? We don't actually go and do data collection in this class. Um, so this is sort of the step that technically we are skipping academically, but obviously when doing science, it's hard to do good science if you don't ever perform an experiment or collect data out there. So this is just the stuff that's usually been done for us. When you see statements that say, we sampled 58 people and found their average height to be 54 inches, blah, blah, blah. That's the experiment having been performed and the data having been collected. Step three, analyzing the data, is essentially what we've been doing in chapter seven with our central limit theorem calculations. What we would like to do is we would like to say, okay, so I collected the sample relative to the hypotheses that I've originally stated. How unusual do I think this sample is relative to that hypothesis? Does this make me want to change my decision or not? Um, so what we're interested in doing with analyzing the data is computing a probability that we would observe a sample such as the one that we saw. Is the sample that we saw, does it seem incredibly unlikely or does that seem very typical relative to what we might expect given um, the, the assumed values for the average or the proportion that we're testing against. Finally, we're going to form a conclusion. We're going to end every significance test just by making a decision between the two hypotheses. It's either the first one or the second one is what we believe to be true. And obviously we would like our data to support that decision that we're making there. So our goal here is to form hypotheses, use our statistics from our sample to determine how likely that sample was relative to our, our hypotheses, um, relative to the assumption of our first hypothesis. And then we're going to decide, do we think that that was a reasonable sample to draw? Or perhaps was that sample so wildly unlikely relative to our hypotheses that me, we might want to, in a sense, change which hypothesis we believe is true? Uh, based on the unlikeliness of the sample. So steps three and four are still going to come next week. Step two is essentially the step that's typically already done for us. Data's already been collected for us. We're presented with statistics. It's really step one that we're going to focus on today. Um, step three, we've in a sense already done. We just don't know how to use step three to help our decision-making process. So next week, what we're going to see is how do we use step three to make the decision associated with step four. That's kind of our, our topic that we'll cover next week here. So let's go ahead and talk about these hypotheses. But before we can talk about these hypotheses, we need to make sure that we're all on the same page with some variables of interest here. Um, I believe that we've seen uh, three out of the six of these here. There's nothing too crazy going on, just a little bit of notation that you're gonna to need to be down with for the rest of the semester here. Um, we want to make sure that we can distinguish in our minds the population parameters relative to sample statistics here. Um, the nice thing for me is that I can always remember which things are parameters, which things are statistics. Parameters with a P are always describing the entire population with a P. Statistics that we have computed are always computed relative to the sample that we've drawn. So statistics are associated with a sample, a small piece of the population. Parameters are describing the entirety of the population. Um, and let me make a quick statement about the parameters here. Um, Now, the only way we ever know a true population parameter, truly know a population parameter, is if we have sampled every single member of the population and uh, aggregated that data into a mean or a proportion or a standard deviation. Uh, performing censuses is pretty, in most cases, is not necessarily a possible thing to do. If we think about even the US census, it costs us like like tens of billions of dollars and we still don't collect all the information from everybody. And then, I mean, even worse, like at least getting a hold of people is okay. If you're a biologist and you're trying to measure, you know, the average length of a Nile crocodile, imagine the possibility of, of trying to actually literally visit and measure literally every single crocodile on the Nile. It's never gonna happen. 
So in most cases, we only can ever access sample statistics, just collecting a small sample of data. And we always want to use the sample statistics. Our hope is that we can use the information associated with our sample statistics to infer information about our population parameters, about the entire population, not just the sample that we saw. So we've already seen that the bar above X is indicating that we compute an average. So X bar and mu are sort of partners. X bar is always a sample average. Mu is always the entire population's average. We're always wanting to use X bar to hopefully make statements about what we think mu is. We're going to use this lowercase s for the sample standard deviation. That's a really convenient one to, all, to, to remember. We have already seen that we use sigma for the entire population's standard deviation. And by the way, we are going to see um, a little funny, uh, not an issue, but a little funny distinction that we're going to sort of just gloss over for a little bit at first. And then out in chapter 10, we're going to kind of come back and say, oh, whoops, we, we, we haven't been distinguishing between these two things here. And then we will. Um, finally, we haven't really discussed our proportions too, too much here, but we did see lots of proportion things come up in our binomial testing out there. Um, what proportion of people are male? What proportion of people have a tattoo? These are yes, no questions. So we get proportions uh, as our responses here rather than averages, right? We don't talk about what is the average, um, you know, we're talking about smoking preference, yes or no. That's not an average question, that's a proportion question. What proportion of the population smokes cigarettes? We might then ask a related average question of cigarette smokers. What is the average number of cigarettes per day that smoked? Now we're back to talking about mu rather than talking about p. So in general, our entire population proportion will be p and p with a little hat on top of it right there. I don't know why these notations have to be different. This one gets a bar, this one gets nothing, this one gets a little hat. Um, talk to the nerds that invented notation for statistics out here. Um, not clear to me why, why we have to change our, 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 our hat symbol across those three right there. But in any event, we will use sample proportions to try and make inferences and estimates about population proportions. So just some, some notation that you've got to know. These six uh, letters out there you will see regularly for the rest of the semester, and we need to make sure that we've got them all straight in our heads here. So when we perform significance tests, we are collecting a sample, and we are using the sample statistics to make decisions about population parameters. Our goal is to make statements about an entire population by only looking at just one sample from the population, right? Uh, get a small bit of information and see how broadly we can kind of push that information out and generalize it to the whole population. To do this, we're always going to form what we're going to call a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. And so, as I've said a couple times already, this is the stuff that you should be expecting to see over and over and over and over and over for the rest of the semester. You are going to form about 100 pairs of null and alternative hypotheses uh, between now and when the semester ends right here. So this is a going to be kind of an, a, a quintessential step one of, of doing statistics here, stating our hypothesis. So these two hypotheses are named the null and the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is always going to be our statement of no change. We're going to have one of our hypotheses be things are the same now as they were before. We're going to notate this hypothesis. We get a capital H for both of our hypotheses, and you can see the subscript is indicating which of the two we're interested in. Null is, is that like a, a Latin word or something? I, I, I'm assuming that's a Latin word, um, but meaning nothing or uh, typically indicating either that a set is empty or that a value is zero or doesn't exist. So a null hypothesis is sort of the lack of something, and in this case, it's the lack of a change. Um, and so here, we will always denote this with an H and a subscript of zero. Alternatively, our alternative hypothesis, H sub A for alternative, it's always going to be the statement that we're actually kind of suspicious as may be true. What we're always kind of thinking is saying like, hey, I've developed this new drug. I think that it actually is going to increase uh, people's ability to fight this certain type of cancer. Our null hypothesis statement will be the statement of no change. This drug has no impact on patients. The alternative, the one that we're suspicious might be true, would be this drug uh, increases uh, patient's survival times or something like that. Right? So our null hypothesis statement of no change, alternative hypothesis is the statement that is reflective of, in a sense, the purpose of why we're doing the study. We think that this drug is going to increase uh, cancer survival times. Um, 
you know, what, what do we think that we're going to see out here? We think that voters have changed their preference from the last election to the current election. It's the statement of change that we believe might actually be true. Um, now, remember that what we kind of said a minute ago is that our, the purpose of our significance test is always going to be to make uh, inferences about uh, population parameters. So what we really want to focus in on here is the fact that this H naught and H A, so H sub zero, typically I'll verbalize as H naught, like N A U G H T, not N O T, not not um, H naught versus H A. Uh, we want to phrase these in terms of the population parameters that we are attempting to make statements about. So it's very, very standard that for our H naught and our H A, we are going to make statements about mu, sigma, or p. We're going to use the information from X bar, S, or P hat to help make the decision about mu, sigma, or P that we see over here. So let's look at a couple examples here and see what we see for some null and alternative hypotheses here. Um, remember that our goal is to make two hypotheses. One is a statement that says no change has happened. The second is a statement that we believe might be true. It's also important that we describe which population parameter we believe that we are discussing in this case. Mu, sigma, or p are population parameters. So an example one, suppose in the 2018-2019 school year, the national average GPA for college students was 2.4. The very first thing I'm seeing right here is we're talking about a national average. That says to me that national average GPA this should be our parameter of interest, our, our average. It's the average across the entire country. The full population average of all college students is mu. And so maybe we can say that in 2018, 2019, mu was equal to 2.4. What we want to do a test for is to, we want to collect data to judge whether the national average GPA increased in the 2019, 2020 school year. So our suspicion is that the GPA perhaps has increased. That's the statement that we think is maybe true. So let's go ahead and write our null and alternative hypotheses here. My null hypothesis, and by the way, just a notational thing, for some reason, a lot of times when I write my null and alternative hypotheses, people think that I'm making a equal sign right here. These are just colons. This is just me about to make a statement right here. What is your null hypothesis? It's this. Uh, this is not an equal symbol right here. The equal symbol is because we're about to make a judgment about the value of a population parameter. Now remember our null hypothesis is always our statement of no change. So if there was no change uh, between the 2018-2019 and the 2019-2020 school year, then it would still be the case that our population average, mu, would still be 2.4. So my null hypothesis is a statement about a population parameter. Oops, that's not 2.5, 2.4. Um, all right, so our null hypothesis is the statement of no change. So it's always, always going to be the case that you are going to get some form of equal sign in your null hypothesis. It might be that we're going to look at like a greater than or equal to or a less than or equal to, but there will always be an equal to component in your null hypothesis. There will never be the equal to component in your alternative hypothesis. In our alternative hypothesis, we're looking to make a statement about what we are sort of suspicious might in fact be true. Why are we even doing this study? We're doing this study because we are wondering whether the national average GPA increased in the 2019-2020 school year. So this is indicating to us the direction that we think that mu has changed in, where mu is the national average in 2019-2020. I should just say this right here. National average... GPA in 2019-2020. So, uh, what we think the case is here then for alternative <coughs> is that our mu value, our <coughs> our average, our national average for the GPA in 2019-2020 is in fact greater than a 2.4. 
So these are now our two competing hypotheses that we want to test against. If we go and we collect a bunch of data, if we go and we sample 100,000 college students from the school year and we find their GPA to be, in fact, a 2.5, then that's probably going to be sufficient evidence for us to suggest that we would reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. On the other hand, it might be the case that we only sampled like 10 people and found their 10 uh, GPAs average to a 2.5. That's probably not enough information for me to decide that the null hypothesis is false right here. This is sort of our default. This is like, unless you can come up with good enough information to get rid of the null hypothesis, this is sort of our baseline that we're sticking with. This is the one thing that we have evidence about. We know what was going on in the 2018-2019 school year. We don't know about what's going on in the 2019-2020 school year. So this is always our statement of no change. This is always kind of our baseline from which we're making all of our assumptions. When we go to perform our calculations for our sample, we are going to assume that the null hypothesis is true. If we then get insane things, like last week when we saw getting a, you know, a height that was, or, or a sample of heights that was seven standard deviations above normal, that was based on an assumption about a population average. We might then go say, listen, we saw seven standard deviations above normal for the sample that we drew. That's so unlikely that I think it's actually more likely that our hypothesis was wrong, that mu is 2.4, than that we would see that seven standard deviations above average for that one sample that we drew. That might be our evidence that says, listen, H naught's probably incorrect, and we would like to reject it in favor of the HA statements about mu that they are, in fact, you know, adult male height was more or less than what we were thinking out there in that example. I'm kind of mixing two examples right there. But again, the point is we have two competing hypotheses. We are always assuming that the null hypothesis is true until we have gathered sufficient evidence to reject it or to just say, nope, yep, we sampled them. Looks like that's still about correct right there. Um, so these are the two hypotheses that we are competing between. Again, notice real quick here that I knew that I was describing mu because I saw that we were talking about an average GPA, right? Just get this whole thing in there, average GPA. That's how I knew we were talking about mu. I knew to make my null hypothesis have an equal sign because the null hypothesis is always the statement of no change. It will always be equal to, less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to. Our alternative hypothesis is always the thing that we're suspicious might be true, the thing, the reason that we're performing the test. So let's go ahead and look at our example number two here, kind of model it after example number one. Example two, again, I'm interested in finding my null and my alternative hypotheses. I know that my null statement is a statement of no change. My alternative statement is the statement that we're suspicious might be true. In 2016, 34.1% of California voters support, supported the Republican candidate for governor. By the way, I just made up that number, but I do know that that is, is vaguely appropriate right there, um, at least uh, an estimate of that. Um, we want to test whether California voters' support for a Republican governor has changed since the last election. So the first thing I'm seeing here to help me decide what I'm doing is I've got to decide what population parameter we're trying to make a decision about. Is this mu? Are we talking about an average of something? Is this sigma? Are we talking about a standard deviation of something? Or is this p? Are we talking about a proportion of something? When I see this percent symbol right here, this is my big key that tells me that we are definitely um, that we're definitely talking about a proportion of something, right? This is how I know that we are having a P discussion right here. A proportion. That's the proportion of voters that supported the Republican candidate for governor. Um, so in this case, I think I want to make statements about a proportion. So my null hypothesis would be my statement of no change. That would say to me there is no change in the proportion of uh, voters in California that supported, supported the Republican governor from last election to the current election. So my statement of no change is, again, going to be my equal to statement here, and that the proportion is 0 0.341. That's just the percent written back as a decimal right there, the proportion of California voters that support a Republican governor.
think about what is our alternative statement here. It's the statement that we are suspicious might be true. It's the reason that we're doing the test because we think that we might show this. Now, a big thing to notice is that in our previous example, we were told that the reason that the research was done was because we were suspicious of an increase in GPA and therefore we phrased our alternative hypothesis to specifically match that. We thought that the average was greater than the 2.4 because we'd seen an increase over time. Over here, all we're saying is we're wondering if it has changed. So when we see just change, that means to me it could be greater than or less than, and either of those would be in a sense the thing that we were looking for here. So all I'm really trying to say here is that our alternative hypothesis is that the population proportion is not 0.341. This wasn't really a directional suggestion right there. We didn't necessarily think it got larger. We didn't necessarily think it got smaller. We just thought it got different, right? And so that includes both greater than or less than, um, both greater than and less than right there for this guy, for the not equal to. But again, in this case, we were not suggested that we believed that it increased or decreased, just that it changed. And if it changed, then it is just different than what it was before. And that we can always use our not equal to to represent that guy. Crap, did I lose my video over here? Uh, where'd my face go? Holy buckets, we're dropping all the frames. Um, camera? Maybe I can unfreeze my camera. Okay, there's a different camera. Good thing I have two cameras, I guess. Okay. Boom. All right, moving on. Um, so now let's go ahead and look at our third example right here. Um, <laughs> third example is uh, trying to make fun of myself a little bit right here. Um, we want to test whether it takes less than an hour and 15 minutes for me to deliver a video lecture. Um, so, uh, and this guy right here, again, where we're asking ourselves for our null and our alternative hypotheses. The first thing I'm gonna ask myself is, am I talking about mu, sigma, or p? All right, which of our three population parameters are we interested in here? I'm not looking at a deviation in t uh, of times, really. Um, and I'm not looking at a proportion of something. I don't see a percentage. This isn't like a yes, no thing out there. So it looks like what I'm really talking about is the average time for me to deliver a lecture. So I think I want to make some statements about mu right here. Um, our statement of no change would be the statement that the value of mu is exactly what the proposed value of mu is, one hour and 15 minutes. Um, by the way, one thing that's going to be really smart for us to do in these cases, notice up here I rewrote my proportion as a decimal. I want to phrase these things in terms of exactly the numerical parts that I'm going to actually work with here. Um, in this case, we get decimals out of our calculator, not percentages, so I phrase this as a decimal. Similarly here, my calculator would never tell me one hour, 15 minutes. Maybe I want to convert this into just straight up minutes. And so that would be telling me mu equals 75 minutes, right? One hour is 60 minutes plus another 15. So an hour and 15 minutes right there. That would be my statement of no change. That says it does take me one hour and 15 minutes to deliver a video lecture. The thing that we might be curious about, the thing that we're suspicious is that maybe it actually takes me less than an hour and 15 minutes for me to deliver a video lecture. And so that is specifically informing my less than 75 minutes. We're testing to see if it's true that it actually takes me less than an hour and 15 minutes to do this. So 75 minutes is one hour and 15 minutes. The less than is what is informing my less than symbol that's right there. Um, and again, we know that we want to make a statement about some population parameter. It was clear to me that we weren't testing against a standard deviation or against a proportion. So we should be thinking about this as an average time that we are spending making a video lecture. So what I want to do first here, or what I want to do next, is 
kind of look at this in the bigger, broader context that we're going to see it. I'm just going to kind of like long form verbalize what one of our full examples will look like, um, just to kind of give us a little bit more context as to like why we're making these decisions right here. Then we'll come back and we'll look and see at how does this decision that we made for our alternatives hypothesis symbol, how does this influence the math that we're going to end up doing um, associated with our with our significance tests here. So um, let's go ahead and look at a full example. And I put full in quotes because we're still gonna skip like a bunch of the mathy parts of this, but at least to verbalize it. So here is my um, here is my setup statement and then the what we do paragraph right there. So it is common knowledge that human body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. We're suspicious that average human body temperature is actually lower than this. So just from reading this paragraph right here, I can immediately state my null and alternative hypotheses. The statement of no change would be, nope, yep, that's right, it's 98.6. It's always our equal to statement. Our alternative hypothesis here is what we're suspicious might be true, that it's actually less than 98.6. Right, that's what we are suspicious is true. That's the reason we're performing this experiment. So our hypotheses are made. That's step one. Step two is collect data and uh, or perform an experiment, collect data. We sample 136 people, find their average body temperature to be 98.1 with a standard deviation of 0.31. So this guy right here, this is our step two. We have performed the experiment and we have collected data. We are now going to use the CLT over here. This is going to be our step three. We are going to say, all right, so we collected a sample. Given that the we're assuming that the null hypothesis is true, if the null hypothesis were true, how likely would it be that we see an example like the one that we drew? A 30, 136 people, 98.1 for the average, 0.31 for the standard deviation. We're gonna come up with some probability out there, and I didn't compute this, this is just me like throwing a number out there. We'll, we'll actually compute this probability next week here. Using the central limit theorem, we are going to determine that this sample has a 1.2% chance of getting drawn if we assume that the null hypothesis is true. That's gonna leave us now with two choices. One thing that we could say is, well, listen, yep, it, it really is 98.6. I guess you just got like a one in a hundred sample out there. Pretty unlikely sample, but that happens, right? I mean, this is, this is probability, this is statistics. Like we're always gonna see variability in the samples that we draw, but that's a pretty rare sample right there, right? Like a 1% chance, it's one in a hundred that we'd see something that's that unusual relative to our null hypothesis. What we might end up instead deciding is saying, listen, that's such a rare sample to get drawn right there. And this one's not even super rare. We're gonna see some that are even more unlikely than this. We're gonna say, it might be the case that we want to say, listen, that's such an unusual sample relative to the null hypothesis that we think there's actually a greater chance that our null hypothesis is wrong than that that's just coincidentally the rare sample that we ended up selecting out there because that seemed pretty unlikely that we'd get all these people with lower than what we expect to be average body temperature if that really was the average. Maybe it's really more like the average is actually 98.25 and therefore the 98.1 is not that weird relative to 98.25, something like that. So our choice that we have to ultimately make, the decision that we're looking to conclude our scientific method with, our hypothesis test with is to say, Either we want to say our sample that we drew is so unlikely relative to the null hypothesis that we want to throw out the null hypothesis and decide that the alternative hypothesis is true. Alternatively, what you could totally see might happen here is we might draw a sample that relative to the null hypothesis, there's a 40% chance of seeing a sample that's that extreme. That means it's totally normal. That's not weird at all. 40% of the time, we're gonna see samples that look like that. And that would say to us, yep, it looks like we agree with our null hypothesis. So we're looking to make a statement about, do we agree with the null hypothesis or not based on the sample that we drew, based on the likelihood of seeing a sample as extreme as the one that we drew. In this case, that 1.2% chance, that might be rare enough of a sample for us to say, I don't know, man, I don't think the null hypothesis is actually true. If it were, we wouldn't have seen a sample that's that crazy. Right? Um, and that's the decision that we want to make. Now, the actual numerical cutoffs are for making that decision, that's what we're going to talk about next week. But I just want us to see, like, why are we forming these null and alternative hypotheses is because we want to compute a probability of seeing the sample that we drew. 
and therefore make a decision of which of the two hypotheses we believe is the correct one based on that data, based on the probability of seeing a sample like that from our central limit theorem calculations here. So finally, I'm concluding with a typical statement here. We reject the null hypothesis based on this unlikeliness, and we conclude that the average human body temperature is, we, I basically am just stating the alternative hypothesis here then. We conclude that average human body temperature is in fact lower than 98.6 degrees. Notice, by the way, what we won't be concluding is things like, ah, so therefore the 98 point what is correct. I don't know that, and I can't know that until I sample the entire population which I'll never do. We're just trying to make correctness statements about individual values rather than trying to make an estimate of the value itself. I can determine that I think 98.6 is maybe wrong. That doesn't necessarily mean that 98.1 is right. That just says that since I got this average from my sample, it seems wildly unlikely perhaps that the 98.6 is correct, wildly unlikely. That's not very wildly unlikely. That's just pretty unlikely. Um, but again, we're going to have to decide what percentage is extreme enough for us to make that decision. That'll come with next week's topics. So again, this is kind of a, a, a wordy version of what we're going to see next week. You should certainly expect for there to be some space in here for us to make this computation, right? We've been given n, we've been given x bar, and we've been given our standard deviation. We will use those to compute the probability of seeing a, uh, a sample of that extremeness, and we will use that probability to make our decision. That's kind of our four steps that we're going to see out there in total. So that's where we're heading with this, and we're going to see now uh, how our decision about how to form our hypotheses here is going to influence the probability that we're going to accumulate here. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at that. These are referred to as the tails of the test. So what I want to do here is, in a sense, revisit each of these uh, statements that we made above and then talk about how we're going to get the probability out of this. This is determining what tails are associated with our test. And you'll see exactly what I mean in a minute when I draw my normal curve diagram. So what I need to go do is re-snag my, uh, my hypotheses from the examples that we did here. So example number one, our hypothesis was that this is our average GPA, mu is equal to 2.4, mu is greater than 2.4. Why do I keep on trying to write a five? It's 2.4, never been 2.5. All right, so here is the null and alternative hypotheses that we came up associated with GPA. So what we're going to end up doing with these guys is we're going to need to compute a probability associated with our sampling distribution, right? We're going to take a sample and we're going to determine the likelihood of having seen a sample that looks like that. In this case, we're always going to start with our, and here I'm going to call this our mu naught 2.4. Mu naught meaning the value of mu assuming the null hypothesis is true. So that subscript of zero is intending to mimic that subscript of zero saying our null hypothesis value of mu is 2.4. If that was our average of 2.4, then it would belong at the center of our normal distribution curve. And what we're going to be interested in is the probability for the alternative hypothesis that the average is greater than 2.4. Now, if you sample uh, 50 people and find that their average GPA is 2.41, then it seems completely plausible to me that the true national average is 2.4. It's a very small amount of variability with only 50 people. That's not quite extreme enough of a result for me to reject the null hypothesis in favor of an alternative that it's greater. On the other hand, if I sampled 50 people and I found their average GPA to be 2.7, then I think that that's pretty strong evidence that our 2.4 is probably incorrect. It's a more extreme result. Notice here that we're only interested in the results where the average is greater than 2.4. So what we're interested in out here is what we would refer to as a right-tailed test. We're interested in seeing this area out here associated with the uh, average being greater than 2.4. Um, so this is an upper-tailed or right-tailed or one-tailed test. Yeah. <laughs> 
generically a one-tailed test. And that's because we are only interested in, in uh, observing extreme values on one end out there. It's the greater than end, the stuff that's above the 2.4. So if we see a small enough probability out here, if we experience a sample that is very, very rare relative to mu being 2.4, then that might cause us to say, listen, even it seems unlikely that the national average really is 2.4 maybe because i drew a sample of 100 people and found the national average or found my sample average to be 2.7 out of 100 people um, that's extreme enough to me that's unlikely enough relative to our 2.4 as the average that i might say i'm pretty sure that our national average is actually greater than 2.4 that probability that we're going to see is going to be in an upper tail a tail to the right where the air where the uh, mu values are greater than 2.4. So notice that our greater than symbol is literally pointing in the direction that we should expect to see our tail. And number two, number two was about our proportions of people that support the California governor being Republican here. Um, we had our null and alternative hypotheses being equal to 0.341 and not equal to 0.341. So we can restate our hypotheses here. We had our hy null hypothesis was that our proportion was equal to 0.341 and that our alternative was just that it was different right this just said we want to know if it's 0.341 or not so you should notice that in this case we have a little bit different of a scenario right here in this case we are still going to center our estimates at what i'll call p naught right here the null hypothesis value of the proportion 0.341 but what we're interested in here is both the less than and the greater than. It could be that we see an extreme result that's in the right tail. Maybe we're going to see a very large proportion of voters that causes us to reject the null hypothesis. Or maybe we're going to see a very small proportion of people supporting a Republican for governor. And that would also be an indicator to us to reject the null hypothesis. This says to me, you, I, I could be okay with seeing things in either extreme out here to give me evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Um, and so this would be a two-tailed test. It's a two-tailed test because we could see extreme results in either direction and count that as evidence towards rejecting the null hypothesis. If we see any, what we would refer to as normal, right, any regular type of samples that we experience, anything that's very near to that uh, uh, 0.341 is our proportion out there, then we'd say, oh yeah, that basically agrees with our null hypothesis and we'd be done, right? Well, then we have nothing to change about what our hypothesis is. So here we're saying we could see very high or very low responses relative to the average response of 0.341 and high or low ones would be sufficient to cause us reason to reject the null hypothesis here. In example one, we were really only interested in seeing results that were greater than 2.4 to reject the null hypothesis. Notice in number one, if we saw a very extremely low average down here, so right, if, even if I got like a 2.0 for my, for my population average of the, or for my sample statistic, if I got a 2.0, I wouldn't want to reject the null hypothesis because I would then be rejecting it in favor of an alternative hypothesis. Uh, and that would be saying that it's greater than 2.4 when I got a result that was maybe 2.0 over here. So when we indicate in our alternative hypothesis uh, these greater thans or these not equal tos, these indicate which areas of probability we're going to want to accumulate when we do our tests out there. Um, you should notice that this one has two tails and therefore is in a sense twice as likely to accumulate the extreme results that we're interested in seeing to reject the null hypothesis. So it matters if we make this choice uh, between greater than and not equal to for these. And finally, for number three, um, we had our my video lectures, our null and alternative where mu is equal to 75, mu is less than 75. So our null hypothesis was that the average time it takes for me to do a lecture is 75 minutes. Our alternative hypothesis is that the average time it takes for me to do a lecture is less than 75 minutes. And so in this case, we're going to again see a one-tailed test. We're going to uh, compute our all probabilities, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So we've got our null hypothesis value of mu. We're centered at 75. We are only interested in seeing these extreme responses over here, right? So this is like me saying, listen, if, I, if it really takes me an hour and 14 minutes, you find over several weeks, 
then that's pretty much in line with our assumption that it takes an hour and 15 minutes, right? If you, if you just watched five video lectures and the average time for five video lectures was an hour and 14 minutes, then that's hardly evidence for you to say, oh man, it is definitely less than an hour and 15 minutes. That could just be a little deviation from what the true average might be of an hour and 15 minutes. On the other hand, if you watched 10 of my video lectures and you saw that they had an average time of only one hour across those 10 video lectures, that would be a pretty extreme result relative to this null hypothesis statement. And that might lead you to say, listen, I kind of think the null hypothesis is false. I watched 10 videos and the average time was only one hour. I want to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the statement that the true average time is less than an hour and 15 minutes. And again, if you watched 20 of my videos and found the average time to be an hour and a half, I wouldn't really want to go rejecting the null hypothesis here because then that would lead me to go with the alternative hypothesis, which is then going to suggest that it was less than an hour and 15, when an hour and a half would kind of clearly suggest that it's more than an hour and 15 out there. So uh, at the beginning, stating our expectation of what we're going to find matters. It matters what choice we make uh, in our hypothesis as far as the equal to's, less than's, and greater than's, because it will influence which probabilities we are trying to test for, which we're trying to come up with with the central limit theorem when we do our computational component, which again, we'll get into Monday of next week. And so this guy right here, I would call this a uh, a lower tailed test. Or a left tailed test. Or simply a, a one tailed test. All right, so again, the decision that you make about the alternative hypothesis is going to influence what area you are interested in finding in your normal distribution curve out there. So it matters that we uh, appropriately set up our alternative hypotheses in particular um, to match the phrasing of the statement so that we are, are looking to compute the, the appropriate regions of interest to get our probabilities of seeing samples that look like that. Notice again, our null hypotheses are always our statement of no change. It's always gonna be our equal to statements. It is possible that we, and let me just write this right here. Um, typically, it's an equal to statement. It may be less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, depending on if the scenario calls for it. Um, this matters less. Making our correct decision about our alternative hypothesis matters more. Um, and so I typically don't myself make a lot of my hypothesis statements null and all, nulls with the less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, but you'll see some of them out there. So what we're looking to move towards here, right? We're, we're still skipping the step of making the computation for today. We're going to do that on Monday. It's really not anything more than what we did in chapter seven. But at the end of the day, once we make that computation and compute the probability of seeing a sample like we've seen, we need to decide if we made the correct decision or not, right? We're going to decide to reject the null hypothesis or not. And it might be that we make the wrong call. And so we need to talk about the decisions that are associated with this. So we're always going to phrase up two competing hypotheses, the null and alternative hypothesis. And there's always going to be two different choices that we could make. It could be that we choose to that the null hypothesis is true. It could be that we choose that it's not true. It could be that it's actually true. And it could be that it's actually false. So there's really four total outcomes, um, two choices, two possibilities of truth. Um, so our four choices are, it's possible that the null hypothesis is our correct statement and that we decide that it's correct. So this number, the first bullet point here is just a correct decision. It was correct and we agreed. The second possibility is that our null hypothesis is wrong and we might want to reject it and we might choose to reject it appropriately. So these top two are our correct decisions right there. Where we see a true null hypothesis and we think it's true or we see a false hypothesis and we call it out for being false like it is. These are our correct decisions. These are our erroneous decisions. These are incorrect decisions right here. Right? These are the ones that we want to stop and say, like, well, I don't know. Does it matter if we make the incorrect decision here? 
It might be the case that our null hypothesis statement is actually true, but that we come up with some evidence that suggests that it's false, or we make the decision that says that it's false incorrectly. Alternatively, flip that around, it could be that our null hypothesis statement is actually wrong, that it's false, but that the evidence that we gather suggests that it's true and we make the decision that we believe that it's true. Both these are incorrect decisions to make with our data. And so we wanna kind of give a name to these and look and see why do we care to look at these. I've got a very good example for you coming up here. Um, we refer to these incorrect choices as type one and type two error. I gotta say, these are like my least favorite named things in all of math because those names mean literally nothing to us. The name of the error type, type one and type two, doesn't indicate to you any, any way to remember which one is which. So this is something that you should write down some examples of so you can keep this straight for yourself. Type one error occurs when we do reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually true. So this is saying the null hypothesis is true, but we believe that it's false. We think that the claim is false when the claim is actually true. On the other hand, type two error is the opposite. This is when we don't reject the null hypothesis, but we should have. Uh, if the null hypothesis is false, but we think that it's true, um, we, we think the claim is true when it's actually false, this is our type two error. So these are just opposites of each other here. Thinking something's true when it's false, something, thinking something's false when it's true. We might have to come back and reference this. I'm going to scroll back up and look at it in our examples right here, our example to make sure that we actually get it straight right here. And here's the deal. While these are both wrong, it's very, very regularly the case that one of them is a much worse type of wrong than the other. This now kind of gets away from us being statisticians and gets closer to us just being people when we're trying to decide the risk that's associated with each type of incorrect decision, each type of error. It is often the case that having either type one or type two error is much more risky than having the other type of error. And so we might want to design our experiments to reduce the risk of, for example, having a type one error, but maybe a type two error is not that big a deal. Or we might want to reduce, reduce the risk of a type two error, but a type one error is not that big a deal. Um, and so I don't want you to think that just because these are wrong, they are in a sense equivalent. It is in most cases that one of them is a much worse error to make than another, but it very much depends on it's sort of like the, the human component of the stats that you're doing. So let's look at a great example of this here. An excellent example. A few years ago, unfortunately, I received a positive test for HIV. Uh, fortunately for me, I don't have HIV. Uh, that was good. Um, but I did have a tough couple of weeks where I sort of thought that I did. So let's talk about how this HIV testing does and should work. In my case, my hypotheses surrounding my HIV status are my statement of no change. My neutral statement is I don't have HIV. That's always been what my assumption was. That was my assumption going on in. The alternative hypothesis here is that I in fact do have HIV. So let's see what happens if I make a type one error in my decision making here or a type two error in my decision making here. Here, a type one error says, I believe that the null hypothesis is false. The null hypothesis says I don't have HIV. I think that's false. That says I think that I do have HIV in the type one error scenario. I think that I do have HIV, but in fact, the null hypothesis is what's true. I don't actually have it. So the type one error in this case would be for me to believe I do have HIV when in fact I don't. It turns out that that's not really a huge societal problem out there. If a bunch of people thought that they had HIV, but they in fact don't have HIV, that's not like dangerous to them and it's not dangerous to other people around them. I had a very bad couple of weeks while I was waiting to, it, it turns out it's really hard to find a place that will just like give you an HIV test. Uh, my experience was that I donated blood um, through, through school. Like this is like, like the graduate program organized like a blood drive. I went and donated blood. I donated blood all the time in my life. Um, it's like the, the 30th time I've donated blood. Um, I go and I donate. A week later, later, I get a letter in the mail and the first sentence says, we regret to inform you that you have tested positive for HIV. And I about crapped myself. 
Uh, my current wife, then girlfriend, was the one that handed me that letter and just kind of walked away because she doesn't need to like see the contents of letters I get from the Red Cross. Why would she think there's anything weird in there? And I just slid that envelope, that, that letter back in the envelope and left my eyes about this wide for about three days and was like, oh my gosh. Um, and it turned out it was actually really hard for me to locate a place that would just straight up give me just an HIV test. And the thing you should think is, whoever needs to get tested for just HIV, it's very often the case that you need a full spread of all STDs getting tested at once. Um, and so most places I found were trying to charge me like $200 to get like a full scan for STDs. And I was like, I don't have $200. I don't think I have anything else other than this. Can't you? I feel like this should be a public health issue, but nope, it took me three weeks to get tested a second time because I couldn't find anywhere that would do it for less than a couple hundred dollars. And that, don't, don't you guys get me started about things that bother me about public health. So here's my type one error. I thought that I had HIV, but I didn't. It was a bummer week for me, but there was no risk associated with it. Now, importantly, super importantly, what's the type two error here in this case? Here, a type two error, a type two error always says, I believe the null hypothesis is true when in fact it's false. That says here, I believe that I don't have HIV when I do. That is incredibly dangerous. It's incredibly dangerous for a person to actively believe that they don't have HIV when they do have HIV. That's very dangerous to the person because they probably need to be getting treatment. It's very dangerous to other people because they might be spreading that to other people, believing that they're not at risk of doing so, right? In this case here, a type two error is a way, way huger, both individual and societal risk than a type one error is. So how does this influence anything? Who cares if we know that a type two error is much more dangerous than a type one error in this situation? Well, what that means is that pharmaceutical companies that generate these HIV tests, they make sure that they almost never give a negative test if somebody's positive, because that would be super dangerous for somebody to get to take a for somebody to do a activity that might result in you getting HIV to give them a test. That test comes back and says, no, man, you're clear, you're negative when actually they have it, because then they might go spread it. They might not be getting treatment when they need to be when they need to be getting treatment. So all tests for very dangerous diseases like HIV, they will very, very rarely give you a false negative. A false negative meaning you get a negative result back, but it's incorrect. It's incredibly rare. And when I say incredibly rare, uh, I went and looked this up at this time. So I did my stats research. When I got this test result back, I immediately kind of knew in my head that there was actually only a very tiny chance that I actually had HIV, even though I literally just got a letter in the mail addressed to me that had a sentence that said, you have tested positive for HIV. Because I know that these tests are designed so that there is essentially a 0% chance of a false negative because those are incredibly dangerous. But there's always gonna be a trade-off with these tests. If you're gonna make sure that there's no false negatives, you are going to increase your chance of false positives. There's just no real way around that. If you're making absolutely sure that everybody who is positive uh, does test positive, then you're also probably gonna tell some people that they're positive when in fact they weren't. That's a false negative right there, right? So um, it happens actually. It turns out that it's not super uncommon for people to test positive for HIV when they don't have it. But it's super rare for people to test negative for HIV when they do have it. And that's good. That is the way that we want that test to be designed. Um, so what this really ends up meaning is, is if you just donate blood and then get a letter in the mail saying you tested positive for HIV, it's actually the case now. Uh, they don't release, eight, or Red Cross doesn't put out like 100% of their information about how they do these tests and what tests they do and their probabilities of false positives and false negatives. Um, but I was able to determine that if you do get a, uh, a positive test for HIV, that there's really only somewhere between like a 10 and 50% chance that you actually have HIV, maybe as low as like a 10% chance that you actually have it, meaning nine out of 10 people. And now this, this is my very vague research here that, that led me to this number right here, but it might be as extreme as nine out of 10 people that test positive don't actually have it and that you just get tested again. If you ever get a negative test, that's essentially a guarantee that you don't have it because we really, really, really want no false negatives in our tests out there. So one negative is good enough to, in a sense, override a positive test out there. It's possible to get a positive uh, out of an, an, 
but not really positive to get an incorrect negative. What I have also learned, uh, by the way, and this is now just getting into specifics of blood drawing techniques, what the Red Cross also does is because very, very few people that donate blood actually have HIV and HIV tests are pretty expensive to purchase. Another thing that the uh, that I know that the Red Cross does is that when they do like a, a blood drive, they, uh, for all of you that have donated blood before, what you know is that they will also collect like three or four vials of your blood that's separate from the donation blood. The vials are just where they test it for like these diseases to make sure it's safe to give your blood to somebody else. Another thing I learned in this process is that what the Red Cross will do is they will take a grouping of these vials, maybe six or 10 of them, and pour, you know, grab one of the vials from each of six to 10 people and pour all that into one container and then stick the HIV test into that one container. Therefore, if just one person had HIV, it's going to flag it for everybody that got poured into that one bucket. All six of those uh, blood samples are going to be thrown away. All six to 10 of those people are going to get letters in the mail saying you potentially have tested positive for HIV. You need to see your doctor and follow up about this. Um, so there's lots of reasons in there why getting a positive HIV test is actually not necessary, is actually still more likely that you don't have it than you do. And we want it designed that way because it's a huge risk associated with a type 2 error, very small risks associated with a type 1 error societally. And so here we have made the decision to err on the side of type 1 errors because they are not dangerous. In this case, type 2 error is very dangerous, so we avoid it. Um, so in this way, we in a sense have a control, a trade-off typically between the errors out here. Um, and in lots of cases, we want to design our experiments thinking that it would be very bad for us if we made, for example, a type 1 error or a type 2 error out there. And so we might design our experiments in such a way or design our tests for diseases in such a way that guarantees that we have a minimized number of the dangerous error and less of a concern about the, the non-dangerous error there. So um, a, a big thing to do is to consider the, the, the risk, the danger associated with making a certain type of error. And so hopefully I've convinced you here that errors are not necessarily always created equal, right? Some just the way that it panned out in this case relative to our null and alternative hypotheses. So one of the questions that we should be asking ourselves when we form our null and hypotheses is, what happens if we make the wrong call? What happens if we make a type 1 or type 2 error? State what is the type 1 or and type 2 error, and then ask yourself, is that bad if that happens? And the type 1 error here, not that bad. Annoying for me personally, not dangerous. Type 2 error, super dangerous for me, super dangerous for people around me. And so the test is designed to avoid the type 2 error. So these are the things that we want to uh, kind of be aware of in our decision making that we're doing here. Um, and we'll see how these type 1, type 2 error risks are going to crop up in how we form our final decision, right? Our, our decision that we make. We decide that the null hypothesis are true or false. We are going to help sort of draw our line in the sand as to what we think is too extreme of a result to allow us to stick with the null or to force us to reject the null. Part of that will be influenced by our knowledge of the risk associated with the type one and type two errors. And we'll see that next week. So today we talked about hypothesis testing. We talked about forming hypotheses. We talked about determining which tails of our distribution are associated with our hypotheses. And we talked about what mistakes we might make when we make our decisions in our hypothesis test and understanding that some mistakes are a big deal and some mistakes are not a big deal here and that we need to know this kind of before we perform our, our experiments. <coughs> and perhaps design our experiments to make sure that we avoid the dangerous types of errors that we might make. So that wraps it up for me here today. Hey, I'm proud of myself. I actually kept that down to more, closer to an hour right here. Um, so next week, what we're going to see is we're going to perform full hypothesis test, our full most simple hypothesis test. And like I said, we're doing basically hypothesis tests for like four out of the next six weeks. Um, we'll also next week look uh, introduce our confidence intervals, I believe. I'm pretty sure that's what's on our schedule for next week as well. Um, so we will perform our full hypothesis test next week and get our confidence intervals introduced here. So your job this week is to make sure that you are fully down with your hypotheses that you're forming, understanding your errors, understanding the tails associated with your tests so that we can perform our, our hypothesis testing next week. Um, that's all I got for you today. Uh,
You should uh, make absolutely sure you're good with all your My Open Math homework for the week here. All the computations that we're doing associated with Chapter 7 and the Central Limit Theorem are super, super important. Those are all the critical computations that are directly associated with all the uh, uh, testing scenarios that we have coming up right here. So you will be using all those computations in the My Open Math homework for Week 8. Um, for the rest of the semester. Those are going to keep on being the same calculations that we're going to do. We're just going to be swapping out numbers for our average and our standard deviation for different values. The spirits of those computations with the normal distribution is going to be exactly the same. So make sure you are drawing your pictures to go with those, identifying the tails of interest, stuff like that. So be good with your week eight My Open Math homework. It's, it's going to follow us for the next six, seven weeks out here. All right, that's it for me for this video. I will see you guys in our first video of week nine in which we will pursue our first full significance test. I'll see you guys next.